Nigeria is the sixth most populous country in the world, with more people than Brazil, and by some estimates could be in third place by 2100 with over half a billion people. With the biggest population, the largest city, and the highest GDP in all of Africa, Nigeria is somewhat of a rising star in the international community. But is Nigeria poised to be a future world superpower, or will the geographic challenges it currently faces end up holding it back? Alright, so this might not surprise anyone who knows even the smallest bit of 19th and 20th century history, but you see these borders right here? Yeah, no matter which map you look at, a country in this shape in this area doesn't exactly seem like it was meant to come together like this on its own. In general, Nigeria can be trisected by the Niger and Benue rivers into three sections, the north, the southwest, and the southeast. The north is drier than most of my jokes and generally supports more pastoralist lifestyles, such as those traditionally practiced by the Hausa and the Fulani peoples. This was also the region that was part of the Trans-Saharan Trade Network. Kano, now the second largest city in the country, would grow to become an important center of trade at the edge of the camel-based trade networks that extended from the Atlantic to Arabia, with Islam spreading into West Africa through this network. The north of Nigeria is within an area known as the Sahel, a sort of transition zone between the Sahara and the rainforest to the south. The more fertile south has given rise to many of the region's once great kingdoms and civilizations, perhaps most relevant being the Oyo and the Benin kingdoms, the latter of which incidentally did not extend into the borders of modern-day Benin, but rather gave its name to the Bight of Benin, for which the modern country of Benin is named. You know, that's actually quite interesting, I should probably plan to go. The largest population in the southwest are the Yoruba, with the largest city on the continent, Lagos, being located in this area. Meanwhile, the southeast is predominantly home to the Igbo, with these four groups making up two-thirds of the country's population. Portugal would make direct contact with the kingdoms of the south by the turn of the 16th century, introducing Christianity into the region, until it gradually faded away by the 18th century and was then brought back by British missionaries, with 45% of Nigerians today being Christian predominantly in the south. They would also come across the Benin city of Eko and notice that the area had a lot of lakes, or in Portuguese, Lagos. Upon European colonization of the Americas, Nigeria would also become a major part of the transatlantic slave trade, as the different kingdoms in the area expanded their continental slave trade to the European powers, who in turn dubbed this part of the West African coast the Slave Coast. Lagos would be bombarded by the British in 1851, under the auspices of ending the slave trade and annexed in 1861, setting up a new crown colony in the area known as Yoruba Land. With the resource wealth of the Central Highlands, particularly in cash crops like oil palms and rubber, as well as cotton, cocoa, and tin, the Royal Niger Company expanded the colony's borders through whatever remained of the Edo Empire, another name for the Benin Kingdom, and later the Sokoto Caliphate in the north, until the British had effectively dock-blocked France and Germany from the area that we now know as Nigeria. Nigeria became a crown colony, with its administration run by the crown, in turn represented by a governor. Though in certain local affairs, traditional rulers were kept in place to serve under the British crown, namely the emirs in the north and the obas in the south. Nigeria would gain its independence on the 1st of October 1960, however it didn't exactly hit the ground running. With over 250 different ethnic groups speaking more than 500 different languages and dialects, many of whose traditional homelands also spill into other neighboring countries, and no group having a clear majority, conflicts between the different groups and the Christians and the Muslims quickly arose. Incidentally, this is, as you could imagine, the main reason why the capital would be moved from the country's largest city Lagos to Abuja, a brand new purpose-built capital located in the direct center of the country. Politically, modern Nigeria's biggest struggle has been maintaining the delicate balance of power between all these vastly different groups, not exactly playing the game on easy mode. From the onset of independence, Nigeria would be ruled by different civilian presidents, followed by military juntas, with the first peaceful transfer of power from one civilian president to another only happening in 2007. Nigeria was originally divided into three states, the north, southwest, and southeast that we mentioned earlier. However, anyone saying you can solely divide all of Nigeria's different groups into just those three categories must be an absolute idiot as these states were gradually split and divided into the now 36 states that the country now boasts. In addition, many Nigerian cities and states have maintained their own traditional monarchs, which, while they don't have all that much political power anymore, still have a lot of cultural power among their respective groups. It also means that, yes, there are actual Nigerian princes despite Nigeria being a republic. 
What makes things perhaps a bit more complex are Nigeria's vast oil fields in the southernmost regions of the country along the Niger River Delta, the traditional homeland of the Ija people. Only a few years after independence, in fact, interregional conflicts and ethnic pogroms came to a head with the breakout of the Nigerian Civil War, which saw the Southeast try to break off and form the independent nation of Biafra, taking the country's oil fields with it. While this never came to pass, Nigerian politics remains at a precarious balance where not much can really pass through the legislature. It's kind of like the gridlock that the US Congress is infamous for, times a couple orders of magnitude. But as is the case with a lot of places around the world, a country having a lot of natural resources does not necessarily mean that the average citizen will get rich off the wealth those resources bring in, as Nigeria is not Norway. Shocking, I know, I would have thought they were the same country too. With more than 80% of Nigeria's exports being something at least tangentially related to oil, Nigeria sold more than 45 billion US dollars of oil and petroleum products in 2022 alone. With 80% of that money going to only 1% of the population, however, Nigeria's GDP per capita still remains barely above $2,000, 146th place in the world and 21st in Africa. However, this fast oil revenue means that the Nigerian economy, and consequently the purchasing power of the average Nigerian, is still tied to the price of oil, and all the wiggly line wackiness that entails. Could I have written a line other than wiggly line wackiness? God, that is really hard for me to say. Now, if Nigeria can get past all this and build a more stable, less corrupt government, it still has every chance to grow into a major power. As I mentioned in the intro, Nigeria's population is skyrocketing from 45 million upon independence to nearly 220 million today. That's not to say Nigeria is going to be completely crammed with people, I mean the country is two and a half times larger than Japan. However, this population growth does give Nigeria a distinct edge, in that, with China's middle class growing rapidly and India definitely catching up in the near future, Nigeria will likely be one of the last countries in the world with a large cheap labor market for overseas companies with perhaps slightly questionable morals. While this applies more or less to Africa as a whole, Africa is a continent of more than 50 countries, while Nigeria is a country of… one country. So that's only one country to sign any major deals with. But aside from becoming China's China and hoping your middle class grows just like China's did, there's still one thing you need to be considered super. No no, not secretly being a terrible person, although that is evidently a good way to compete for the title the second best show on Prime Video. No, what I'm really talking about is influence over other countries, particularly in the form of soft power. Nigeria's film industry, also known as Nollywood, is second only to Bollywood in the amount of movies they put out every year. Yes, even including Hollywood. This soft power, combined with Nigeria's rapidly growing economy and emerging middle class, has turned Lagos into one of the main economic nexuses of the continent. With its borders formed by arbitrary colonial divisions that split up related groups and merged them with radically different groups, and yet being incredibly resource rich and having a rapidly growing economy, Nigeria is somewhat of a case study for the rest of Africa, in particular the larger countries like South Africa and Dr. Congo. Are Nigeria's or any other African country's borders perfect? God no, but that could be a topic for another video. But Nigeria, I'd argue, is a country that has just as much potential as it does drawbacks. 